Um, welcome everyone and thank you for joining for today's short course. What is science of policy and how can you get involved? My name is Chloe Hill and I am the EGU's policy officer. I'll be introducing you to the session today and all of our fantastic speakers. Okay, so the plan is to start on a small personal scale and then gradually get broader until we have an international focus. These are today's fabulous speakers. So first we have Solmaz, who is a postdoc at the University of Tübingen in Germany. After outlining what science of policy is, she'll be talking about her own personal experiences with some science of policy activities and her motivation for getting involved in these. The second, the second speaker today is Flo, who is the head of policy and engagement at the Geological Society of London. Now, Flo will talk about some of the society's science of policy activities and how you can get involved in those. Then we'll jump back to me, and that is when I'm going to be talking about the EGU's science of policy activities, um, which are primarily focused in Europe and on EU governing bodies. And finally, we have Sophie Berger. Sophie is the, a science officer within the IPCC's Working Group 1 Technical Support Unit. So Sophie will be explaining a little bit about what the IPCC is, um, what it does, what she works on, and how it really is at the interface of science and policy. Okay, but before we do get started, um, I am just going to go over a couple of the basic terms because I know for some people watching today, this will be the first time they've actually heard the phrase science of policy. Um, so what is it? The first term we have here is policy. And this is obviously a word that is thrown around a lot, but generally it means a plan of action developed to assist in ach achieving a desired outcome evidence informed policy making when policymakers use the best available evidence to help them make decisions. We often think about evidence as scientific research, but it can also be statistical data or an evaluation of the options that are available. Basing policies on evidence might seem very obvious to some of the people watching today, especially if you are a scientist, um, but it doesn't always happen and there are various reasons for this. One reason might be that the policy decision is just too complex. It can't possibly involve um, all of the evidence, or there isn't sufficient time to gather the evidence that is needed before the decision has to be made. Um, another reason might be that the policymaker um, or policymakers in charge don't don't see the reason or don't understand the reason for um, for the evidence or for the information that's needed. Um, another reason might be from the scientist side, where they haven't been able to communicate their research or information clearly enough. So in an ideal world, this would you know, always be the case, but it isn't necessarily. Um, and that is why science policy, the third term we have there, is so important. And that, of course, is what we are talking about today. It's research that provides decision makers with relevant information and aims to strengthen the policy making process. And I will dive into more depth on this in my own presentation and so will all the other speakers. And the last term we have there is policy for science. So this is policies relating to science, such as public research funding, education, innovation, all of these kind of things that help support scientists and help support research. Okay, so on that note, I am going to pass over to Selmaz. Well, uh, thank you, Chloe. Um, so my science policy story begins in northern Pakistan uh, in 2006. So um, I'd like to take a moment just to take you to northern Pakistan with me. Um, the photograph that you are looking at um, right now um, is a photo of some of the very few survivors of the village uh, in northern Pakistan that was almost completely destroyed by the 2005 Kashmir earthquake. Now, I was there as a geologist to do some field work after the earthquake occurred. Uh, but of course, uh, my geologic investigations uh, took place in the backyard of many people who had survived the earthquake. So um, that brought me very close to the people who had um, suffered from the earthquake, who were um, in the process of uh, mourning um, the, the loss of loved ones and the destruction of their community. 
And of course, um, oftentimes we engaged in uh, multiple dialects and those dialects uh, almost always um, concluded with three questions. So the very first question that I was almost always asked by earthquake survivors in Pakistan was, um, why is this happening to us? Why is this earthquake creating, bringing so much misery to us? And uh, that was almost immediately followed by question um, two, which is, why does this happen? What causes earthquakes? And then the third question uh, was, when, well, is there something I can do about it? And if so, what is that thing that I can do to make sure that I am more prepared for future earthquakes? So as you can see, the very first question um, really reflects the sense of fatalism that many earthquake survivors, not just in northern Pakistan, but in many communities, um, have um, when they experience an earthquake, especially if they haven't er experienced an earthquake for a very long time and they're not aware of it. But as, as soon as um, they receive a little bit of information uh, about earthquakes and what causes earthquakes, uh, they become very curious about it. And that question becomes about um, what, what causes an earthquake. And, um, and of course, once they enter this stage of inquiry, then um, naturally they want to know what uh, they can do to mitigate damage. So they want to know what types of actions they can take. And I think what is really important here is how we can actually help communities move from this sense of fatalism, the sense that they are uh, doomed, that they cannot do anything, um, to um, inspire them to take actions. And uh, sometimes just by providing some really basic information uh, shared in a very effective way with them, um, we can really um, uh, make that process happening, going, going from fatalism to action. Now, when I was um, engaging in this dialogue with uh, earthquake survivors, I was not really aware that I was doing some kind of a science policy work there. Um, I simply uh, considered it as some kind of a dialogue with them and maybe the information that I give them will help them um, become a bit more curious, um, maybe ask more questions um, of the uh, village authorities and uh, find out some solutions to some of the issues that they have. But the more I thought about this process of going from fatalism to action and how knowledge can enable that process, uh, the more I realized that actually that's really close to what science policy um, is. Um, and in my own definition of science policy, again, it's, it's about having a dialogue. Um, it's not one way street. Um, all the stakeholders that are involved in science policy um, have uh, a place to contribute. So for instance, this dialogue in this case is between scientists, between policymakers, and also with the society as well. And um, in my definition, this is always almost um, focused on um, a problem solving, uh, problem solving. So there is a problem and we want to find a solution to it. Um, and in this case, we want to apply scientific knowledge, scientific information to the policy making process to really move from having the recognized a problem and wanting to do something about it to actually doing something about it and coming up with a solution that um, works for those involved in the dialogue. So, now I want to take you to uh, a few years after that, um, when I heard the term science policy and um, I wanted to take my very first steps to officially get more involved and learn more about what science policy is, especially in theory, because I had absolutely no theoretical understanding of it, though I had some hands-on experience uh, doing communication and outreach work in uh, Central Asia. So my very first theoretical experience started with um, an EGU session um, in my own division, which is Natural Hazards Division. And I was attending um, a, a session called Natural Hazards Education, Communication and Science Policy Practice Interface. And this is a session that um, I think almost uh, every year has been offered um, at the EGU General Assembly meeting. And um, first I started as a participant and for the years after that, I, also, I was also invited to uh, co-convene the sessions uh, with my co-authors. So that really um, brought me into the world of science policy um, uh, in terms of the theory and a little bit of the practice. And of course, um, 
I started taking policy courses also at the EGU. And one of the uh, policy courses that I was really interested in and also keeps um, being showed up in the programs of the General Assembly is how can scientists get involved in the policy making process? And just as recently as last year, uh, one of the great debates talks um, focused on science policy, um, science and policy making who is responsible. And uh, last but not least, um, networking at the EGU General Assembly meetings was really um, uh, the cherry on the top. Um, meeting the EGU policy officer, uh, learning about uh, some of the activities that take place not just during the meeting but also outside of the meeting and hanging out at the early career scientist zone, drinking lots of coffee uh, with those who are involved in science policy and those who are interested and want to get started with science policy. So as you can see, um, my path, my personal path to science policy um, was very much uh, enhanced by the activities that was offered to me by um, EGU and uh, being able to take advantage of those opportunities really pushed me forward um, on my path to science policy work. But many of these um, examples that I've listed on these slides are theoretical, and I was really hungry for some real hands-on um, science policy work. And uh, thankfully, um, EGU offers um, a, a pairing scheme, a science policy pairing scheme that is designed to do that. Uh, so um, I was very lucky to be able to go to the uh, European uh, Parliament um, last year um, as part of the EGU science policy pairing scheme. And the way the pairing scheme works is that a scientist and a policymaker are paired together for two days in Brussels. And um, as you can see in this photograph on the right, we have the policymaker um, from Finland and uh, the scientist, which is me here in this case, and we've been brought together by this scheme to talk about some of the issues that affect um, the coastal communities of the Baltic Sea, especially those related to climate change and the sea level rise. Now, this pairing scheme is very beneficial to both the scientist and the policy um, maker. In this case, the policy maker was able to really tap into uh, my scientific input about the Baltic Sea region and, and use that information to inform uh, the policy making process. And me as a scientist, I was able to um, shadow um, this policymaker for two days and really get a hands-on experience of how uh, policymaking works and really how complex it is. Um, so this was quite beneficial to me as a scientist. Now, um, there's a lot more that happened in those uh, two days that I was in Brussels and I was uh, uh, asked to write a blog about it and you can go to this uh, EGU blog to receive more information about exactly what this pairing scheme is and um, some of the activities that I was engaged in uh, during the time that I was in Brussels. But I thought that I would just take a moment to uh, point out three lessons that uh, really uh, stood out the most for me during this uh, week. So the very first lesson was um, be ready to help. So when you are uh, contacted and you are asked to get engaged with the policy making process, um, I think it's really easy to say, oh, you know, I'm not an expert uh, on this particular topic that you're asking me to uh, provide input on, but I encourage you to make that really your last resort. Um, because after all, you're a scientist and um, being a scientist means that you also have been trained to think critically and to be able to tap into the vast network of other scientists that you have access to. So by contacting your colleagues and those who have more information on the topic that you've asked to provide some uh, input, um, you can also put together um, in a very concise way uh, some information that could potentially be very useful for a policymaker. Now, the second lesson was to keep up the pace. Um, the world of policy is complex and very fast. Um, so it's very important to be ready to work with very little information. Um, and in this case, I would really suggest to again, um, tap into your network um, and um, see who has what piece of information, um, ask a lot of questions, um, of the policymaker, and if they don't have very specific questions uh, concerning the topic that you're concerned with, uh, you can also help them formulate those questions. 
And then last but not least, um, try to tell a story when uh, you engage with policymakers. Um, and if you don't have a story, you can't make the issue personal or give it um, an interesting angle, um, talk to other people, see if they have a story and use their story. As long as you can credit them appropriately, I think there's really nothing wrong with that. So um, if um, you are going to learn a new skill, um, and let's say this is the uh, science policy um, work or anything even um, outside of science policy work, um, oftentimes um, it's very natural for us to say that, gosh, you know, I will never get good at this um, or feeling very ignorant. I think it's very important to realize that um, uh, this is a very emotional statement and it says nothing about your um, intellectual capability. We are all intelligent people and we are all capable of learning. So um, when we make a statement like this, it's oftentimes rooted in the fact that we just don't have enough information, we just don't have enough um, learning and practice uh, of the skill. Um, so the very um, first thing that I recommend um, when it comes to learning a new skill that is uh, a little bit outside of your field of expertise, especially in the context of science policy work, is first of all, find out if you like it. Um, if you, you don't have to be passionate about it, but um, find out if you like it, get a taste of it. And as I mentioned um, earlier, some of the activities that EGU and other organizations offer um, really give you the chance to get your foot in a little bit and uh, test the water, see what it tastes like, and see if you like it. Um, my personal view is that if you really don't enjoy science policy work, if you don't care for it, if it makes you very nervous, if, if you just don't want to do it, um, it's a little bit pointless to spend time doing it. So first find out if you like it and give yourself multiple chances to experience that and try not to write it off after you know the first time you try something that's related to science policy. And then of course, once you know that this is something that uh, you're curious about, that you like, that you want to explore a little bit more, um, go ahead and learn it. Learn as much as you can about it. Tap into your resources, attend conferences, courses, um, talk to colleagues, talk to those who have more information for you. And um, practice, and practice some more. Um, I think with um, what is clear is when you're learning a new skill, um, the most important thing is to do, uh, to learn it by doing it. And I think um, that applies to science policy as well. So um, that's all I've got to say. And um, I'm gonna pass the um, conversation now to Flo. Hello everyone. Um, thanks so very much for tuning into this short course. Uh, my name is Flo Bullo and I'm the Head of Policy and Engagement at the Geological Society of London. Um, so a little bit about the society. We are based in London and we're the UK's professional body for earth science um, and we have a worldwide membership of over 12,000 people. Um, we were founded in 1807, so we are the oldest geological society in the world. We're normally housed in our lovely offices on Piccadilly in London, um, although we're all in lockdown at the moment, so nobody's there. Um, and we do a number of activities on behalf of the community um, from our building. These include scholarly publishing, education, outreach and policy work, professional chartership um, and we also accredit degree courses in the UK and we host a number of member-led scientific conferences and um, careers fairs and exhibitions etc in our building. So how and why or why do we do policy work? Well I think it's very important, no surprises there. But um, So we do this mainly with the aim of c communicating the vital role of geoscience um, in meeting a range of um, current and future challenges. And we offer our members in particular the opportunity to contribute their expertise and evidence to our responses and reports um, relating to both the UK and sometimes EU policy as well. So in our experience, it's not always immediately obvious how geoscience relates to a number of areas of public policy or vice versa because of the 
how much expertise and specialism there is and we see our role as presenting geoscience information in an understandable way and uh, in, a, in a policy context so it can be better absorbed into the policy making process and we divide our policy work into two areas so the first as Solmaz has been talking about is science for policy so providing and communicating geological evidence as it relates to areas of policy under development so for example this might include the importance of carbon capture and storage and geothermal in meeting net zero or paris decarbonization targets for example um, and we also represent the community in a number of areas of policy for science so this is where policy or legislation which impact on the structures that support geoscience research um, learning and skills so for example immigration policy or policy relating to research funding or, or future investment in research um, and we do this mainly by working collaboratively with others across the science sector because so many policy for science areas impact other disciplines um, in similar ways they do to geoscience and we think it's really important that these channels of communication and information between scientists and government are open and effective um, so that we can have good robust evidence-based policy making and also to help meet the many challenges we face now and in the coming decades uh, so how do we do this work well in a number of different ways so we carry out a mixture of reactive and proactive policy activities um, on the reactive side this is quite UK government focused. Um, we respond to consultations and inquiries that are published by government and parliament and other third sector organisations. This is usually in the form of written evidence on a given topic that they're seeking information on. And on the proactive side, we um, identify topics and areas where we think there's a lack of understanding of the, or the awareness of the relevance of geoscience to this area. So, and these are often selected for the development of statements and briefing modes, uh, which are longer reports um, where we seek to frame geoscience issues in the context of current policy challenges and themes. And the briefing notes that we develop, which I'll show you some of later, they're used by geologists to understand um, areas relevant to public policy in our science, but also we share them with policy professionals and politicians around the UK to help develop wider understanding of our science and its relevance and we also hold a number of conferences and activities in the society which are policy themed um, and in particular we have a series called the Brian Lovell conference series which focus on areas of geoscience as they relate to major societal challenges so in the UK recently uh, there's been quite a clustering of science for policy themes um, there's been an, a lot on energy and climate change and on geotourism, uh, lots on the impact of Brexit, on um, research funding, immigration, skills availability, etc. Uh, so there's not much, well, that's not much of a surprise. And we also work a lot on geological disposal of radioactive waste, which is a major policy area at the moment, uh, because we are, the UK is developing a geological disposal facility. Um, and where we can, we try to work with other organisations where there are crossover areas. So we work with the Royal Astronomical Society on issues to do with satellite and earth observation and others in the science policy field. Uh, when it comes to our strategic work, we have developed a programme of critical issues that we focus on. Um, and these include the role of geoscience in delivering areas of major policy such as the energy transition, sustainable access to minerals and materials uh, and delivering the sustainable development goals. Um, and these are areas where we think the understanding of the role of geoscience and the subsurface are very critical to the excess of these policy areas. So for example, a failure to consider a source or a security of lithium in um, meeting electric vehicle targets would significantly impede success. So we try to map um, te pull these areas together and explain the relevance of our science and of the subsurface um, to those who are not as in the know as us. Um, the key approach for us on doing this has been to map bits, relevant areas of science information and processes and case studies to specific policy initiatives um, to, tr to help communicate their relevance because most people working in policy and government have very limited bandwidth to accept to take on new information or cover new areas so it's really it's really important that we very clearly match those that information and those skills with those policy areas um, I'm never going to as much as I'd like to sit down 
um, people working policy and give them a short course on geology. That's never going to, we're never going to have time to do that. Um, and so recently I've just shown there like a policy report we did recently on geology and, and sustainable development goals. And we worked with geology for global development on that. And that's been shared widely at UN meetings and meetings around the UK as well. So most recently, we've been focusing on the links between geoscience and decarbonisation. Uh, this was kicked off mainly by a major Brian Lovell meeting that we held in early 2019 to bring together geoscientists from a range of backgrounds to examine the role of geoscience in the decarbonisation of power, heat, transport and industry um, in the UK, but also further afield, all of which are key pillars in the drive to meet the net zero targets that the UK adopted last year. So we had three days of very technical discussions and then we followed this up with a policy briefing session where we opened up invitation to um, policy and decision makers working in government, in parliament, others in third sector organisations dealing with climate and climate policy, etc. And we had a really good discussion about the barriers to progress in this area, both regulatory and technical, and did a good bit of knowledge sharing. And this was followed by the production of a short briefing note I've just included there. Um, covering the main points of the meeting and this was shared widely last year when a year in which the UK government both adopted net zero by 2050 as official policy but also began preparations for the now postponed hosting of COP26 which will happen next year and we'll be involved in that too. And then we've done a number of follow-on activities on this theme including the establishment of decarbonisation working group which are a number of experts that are advising the society on effective activities and the publication of an article in the UK Parliament's journal Science in Parliament with Mike Stevenson at the British Geological Survey. So beyond decarbonisation this is just a few examples of the statements and briefing notes we've um, published in recent years. So we developed these with member expert input um, on a number of other a number of geoscience topics with a broader public interest. So examples of these include our climate change statement, which presents the evidence from the geological record for climate change, um, and a note on responsible investing in natural resources, which stemmed from a meeting on the same topic last year. And our flagship policy report is Geology for Society, which outlines the key ways in which geoscience links to major areas of public interest, the economy and sustainable development. I should add that all of these documents are available for free on our website. I've included the link there. So if you want to have a look at any of those or get a feel for any of them, please do go ahead. And this, the Geology of Society report was produced um, in response to conversations directly with government in the Government Office for Science, who were seeking a succinct document that explained the relevance of geology to um, a number of policy areas. And on this, we also collaborated with the European Federation of Geologists to translate it into 12 European languages, which are also available on the website. So you can, that now has maximum reach across a number of European countries and is used individually by societies across the, the European Union. And then in addition to the Brian Lovell conferences and meetings that we hold most, almost, well, every year, that's an annual meeting. We do also hold standalone policy briefing sessions at our offices in London on areas such as communication of risk, shale gas, lithium and metals for the energy transition, to just name a few. And we engage with the governments of the devolved nations of the UK, sitting on standing committees about science. And we also have a regular programme of events at the devolved parliaments. So just a quick bit on policy for science. Um, so in addition to communicating technical information to government and parliament, um, we also work alongside our colleagues in the science sector, as I mentioned, to represent the geoscience community. So two major areas that we've done this in the last few years is um, thinking about education curriculum, um, how is geoscience delivered to pre-18 curriculum and also immigration policy which has been a major area especially since the result of the EU referendum and this is about trying to communicate the important role that geoscience skills have in our economy and making sure that we make provision for them wherever possible. Slightly broader than that across the team um, we've been working to try and improve understanding of geoscience and the different areas that it builds into because there's common misconception that really we just work in oil and gas and resource extraction with some members of the policy community so we the education developed the team developed this poster um, last year which has now been given out for free to 400 schools and university departments which links our science to 
various career opportunities, but also a number of developing technologies that will be crucial in the future. If you'd like a copy of one of these, you can contact the head of education who I've just added there and she'll get one posted out to you as soon as she's out of lockdown. And then lastly, if you want to get involved in science policy work or it's an area that interests you, um, we couldn't do any of this work without the willing contribution of um, geoscientists and um, their expertise and willing to communicate. And there are a number of organisations, EGU, AGU, the Geological Society of London, that do this sort of work. So if you're interested in this area, it's worth getting in touch to ask about how you might be able to contribute. At the Geological Society, we've set up a database of expertise where you can enter your details and information about your area of work. And we contact you about upcoming consultations, inquiries and projects. And you can see all that information there. Lastly, thanks very much for tuning in. I hope this has been interesting. And uh, if you want to get in touch with me, there's my email address and handle. Um, and now I'll pass on to Chloe. All right, thank you, Flo. So I'm starting off my presentation with some information that was collected from potentially some of you. Um, it was collected during a member survey that we conducted late last year. It had almost 1800 respondents, so it was a pretty good sample size. Um, and I'm really excited to share this with you because we haven't released this data publicly before. Um, and actually we are still analyzing the data, so we can't give you much more information than this, but we will release that towards June, July this year, hopefully. Um, so this is a little bit of a teaser. But one of the questions we asked our members was what EGU activities and resources they value most. Now you can see here on the screen, obviously the General Assembly came in first. I think that is a surprise to exactly no one. Um, and second is our open access scientific journals. So these are the two things I think we, we all expected to come in first. But if you have a look at the fourth position, you'll see policy resources and activities. And this was a surprise to actually a lot of people, including myself, um, that our members actually valued this so highly. It was a, obviously a very positive surprise for me. Um, and if you're watching this and you haven't heard much about science or policy before and still aren't really sure what it is, this might come as a bit of a, a surprise to you as well. You might be wondering what motivates people to get involved in science or policy and why, why they would appreciate these activities so much. And of course, there's a lot of different reasons for this. Um, Solma has actually outlined a few um, before, but some of my, my top reasons that usually I give to people for getting involved in science or policy is the fact that it can increase the impact of your research, it can help you to expand your professional network. It can create new opportunities for you, especially in terms of like if you're networking with a policymaker, um, you might see where more research is needed or um, where research funding is. And it can also help minimize misinformation and help increase transparency and policy making. So there's obviously some altruistic reasons in there as well. Okay, so this is where it gets interesting because science of policy especially in Europe, can get complicated. I mentioned earlier in the webinar that almost all of the EGU's activities are focused in Europe and on the EU governing bodies. But I guess when I say this, it is a little bit hard to conceptualise. So here's a diagram to help explain it. Now, when I say this, I am joking a bit because even though this is a simplified version, the diagram is still very complicated because it shows all the different linkages between the key EU institutions. And while science is used by all of the EU governing bodies in some way or another, I'm not gonna sit here and explain it to you. And that's partly because it needs a webinar of its own, um, but more because you don't need to know it all. Um, the details can be interesting if that's what you're into, um, but you don't need to know them to share your own research with policymakers and really engage. So in fact, I think some people see how complicated the EU system is and they're a bit overwhelmed by it all and this prevents them from engaging at all. So if you're just starting out your science or policy journey, you can look into websites of other institutions or organizations such as the EGU um, and find opportunities to engage that might be a little bit less intimidating 
um, or you can just focus on one of the institutions and really look into the opportunities that they provide. So the takeaway message here is, it can be complicated, but it doesn't have to be. And this shouldn't stop you from sharing your science. So for an activity you can easily engage with, I'm going to go to my next slide, which is the EGU's annual science policy event. Um, so this is held, as the name suggests, every year in Brussels, usually in September or October. Um, and it gives geoscientists and policymakers the space to meet and discuss issues and topics that are important to the geoscience community. It is sometimes difficult uh, to really think of an issue that's relevant for a broad range of geoscientists, but we do really try to do that. We also try and pick a topic that's very relevant and topical for policymakers. Um, and as you can see in the picture, uh, this is from the event last year, we do this usually in the form of roundtable discussions because this really gets people to interact over certain themes and certain um, discussion points. And we have a moderator for these tables so the session doesn't go completely out of control. Uh, it is a lot of fun. It's usually a relatively small event. So we have between 80 and 100 people or something like that and a mix of scientists and policymakers. Um, this year's event, 2020, fingers crossed it can happen. Of course, it still depends a lot on COVID-19, how it progresses, whether we're able to gather in large groups, all of that kind of stuff. But we're hoping to have it on the European Green Deal. So this is a topical event. It's also very relevant for geoscientists. Um, and we're also aiming to have it in the EU Parliament. So actually within the building itself, which will make it really easy for policymakers and members of the European Parliament to attend. It'll also be open for everyone to, to access free of charge. So there will be a limit on the number of people we can we can have register. The limit will probably be about 100 people, I think. Um, but until it's filled up, you can, you can access it. Um, it is a really good opportunity to sort of learn more about the European Parliament, for example, and, and meet some of the people working there. Um, but I know it is in Brussels and it might not be accessible to you depending on where you're located um, and also depending on your schedule. The EGU is aware of this as well. So in conjunction with our annual policy event, we also run um, an annual early career scientist policy competition, which is open to all early career scientists within seven years of their PhD um, who are based in Europe and are EU, are EGU members. Um, and this will provide the person who um, it's awarded to, it will provide them with travel expenses um, and accommodation being paid for by the EGU. So. Uh, it, it makes it a little bit easier. Um, for any more information on the EGU's policy events, how you can get involved, and of course the ECS policy competition, uh, you can have a look at our website. I will link it in the description down below, so you can just click the link. And there will be more information about the event in 2020 coming up soon. So probably late May, early June, um, assuming it's able to go ahead. So keep an eye out for that. Okay, and something else we have on our website is just bits and pieces of information that could be useful to you if you are interest, interested in science of policy and engaging in science of policy activities. Uh, the first thing we have listed there is the EU policy news page. This includes not only legislation news or news that might be of interest to geoscientists in terms of EU policy, um, but also opportunities. So this can relate to funding opportunities, um, questionnaires or consultations that open up when, they, when the EU Commission really asks for information. Um, it could include internships or fellowships, huge range of things. If I find them and think they will be of interest to geoscientists, I will put them on this page. Um, the second thing is our resources page. This is a little bit different in that it really just links to resources from other institutions and other organisations. It could be something like a fact sheet on how to talk to policymakers um, or how a particular EU institution works. So it it's really is quite a range of um, different articles and bits of information in there. But if you have your own that you would like to share, you think will be of interest to people who are looking at our website, um, you can always send that through to me and my email is just on the page there. And the last thing on this website is the science policy calendar, which unfortunately is looking a little bit bare at the moment just because of the whole COVID-19 crisis. Um, again, meeting and uh, meeting up and hosting events is, is difficult lately, but hopefully that will fill up again soon. And here you'll find a whole range of 
science for policy events. Um, it might be events that are being held by the commission or by the parliament or by another organization where policymakers will be that is also relevant for geoscientists. And the final thing I want to share with you is the EGU's database of expertise. So similar to the one that Flo mentioned, it's a way of us being able to share monthly emails with you that include different science for policy opportunities, information, and also some EGU activities in there as well. Um, it's also a way for us to see what your areas of expertise is and how you'd like to get involved in science or policy and if an opportunity arises, if we need some um, specific information or if a, a policymaker has requested a specific type of scientist, we can then go into our database and try and find them. So it is really important that if you do join the database of expertise, you fill in your EGU profile. And if you are already a member of the database of expertise, you can still do this. Just log on using your EGU login details um, and fill that out or, or update it if you haven't updated it in a while. Um, and that will really help us out when we do need experts. So that is all from me. Thank you very much for listening to my presentation. And I am now going to pass it over to Sophie. All right, so uh, most of you, if you've heard about the IPCC or the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, you know us for making reports on climate change, but it's actually a little bit more complicated than that. And so the role of the IPCC is to assess the scientific knowledge on climate change and that on a global level. It has to be policy relevant, meaning that the end user of those reports are going to be the governments. But if it's policy relevant, it cannot be policy prescriptive in the sense that uh, the report may not tell you must do this or that, but rather if you do this, that will happen. If you do that, this will happen. And also something that is quite important is the fact that the APCC is not doing any research when they do the reports. They are just assessing the scientific literature in the sense that they are screening to all the relevant paper on climate change. And then they are trying to compile this information in a report, a little bit like a review, but it also goes one step further than a review because in a review it would be A says this, B says that, and that's pretty much it. While in a, in an assessment, it goes one step further in the sense that it gives a confidence level in the general state of knowledge. So this is something also very important. And then an, an also important part of the APCC report is that the key messages of the report are really condensed in a 20 page summary for a policymaker. And this is really uh, the most important document because this is really the summary of thousand pages of report and even more pages of uh, scientific papers. And this is really uh, the information uh, on which the governments focus. So really the, the, um, the IPCC is really a body which is working at the interface between science and policy because on the policy side, we've got the, the IPCC plenary and the government delegated who are in the end, the, the end user of, uh, of the IPCC report and on this knowledge. And then on the science side, we've got the report's authors, the, the, the scientific scientists who are editing and also reviewing. And then in the middle, you've got the technical support unit, so where I'm working, and also the bureaus, which are acting at, as a kind of steering committee, and which are making sure that there is some kind of communication between the policy world and the science world. So you might wonder uh, why is the IPCC important? And in a nutshell, all the five assessment reports so far have been uh, have been linked to a major policy decision when it comes to uh, climate change. One of the most important ones is the UNFCCC, which laid the base for uh, for climate action because that's when they decided to. Um, to try to avoid dangerous uh, human interference with the climate. But then the other reports have, brought, have synthesized more knowledge about climate change and have really been useful to lay the basis of the Kyoto Protocol, the Paris Agreement, and also probably what's coming in the future. Uh, 
And so uh, as for how an IPCC report is, is produced, it's a long process which takes uh, several years. And it's a little bit of a complicated process because the IPCC is at the interface between science and policy. But let's simplify that in three steps. So first of all, we've got the preparation of that, where the, uh, the outline of the report is approved and also the team of people, the op authors who will draft the report. This is all upstream of the making of the report. And then comes the main phase of the report, which is the writing of the report, where the team of authors gather, come up with several drafts. There are several rounds of reviews, from two from the experts, two from the government. And then comes the final bit, which is where the, the report is approved and accepted and then published. But you can see that it, the, the, policy, the, the policy world is involved in many, many steps. It's heavily involved in the making, in the preparation of the report, in the sense that we want to make sure that it's policy relevant. So this report needs to, uh, to tackle some issues that, that are important for uh, policymakers. It's also intervening during the, the making of the report in the sense that governments uh, need to be able to give some feedback on the on the report which is being made because they are the end users. So we need to make sure that actually this answers the question they have. And then the last bit is that uh, uh, governments are really the one approving the summary for policymaker and accepting the reports. And it needs to, to be done so, so that it's really a strong basis that it means that if a report has been accepted by all the hundred and over 190 governments of the, of the UN, then it makes the report much, much stronger because it shows that the science that is written in the report is really robust. And then comes the question is that uh, how, how as a scientist you can get involved and there are different ways. You can either get involved upstream of the making of the report by writing papers, which will then be used for the assessment of the report. And in this kind of, uh, in the paper, um, the, the reviews and the community efforts looking on the global level are particularly useful. You can also be involved in the IPCC process itself as an author, an editor, or a um, chapter scientist. But this is a little bit late because we are quite far in the in the process in the, the current uh, cycle. But what you can do and you can do at the moment is reviewing the report as an expert, as a scientist, to make sure that uh, it's not missing important literature or that the, the message is clear enough. And also a last way of being involved with the IPCC process is downstream of the, uh, the publication of the report once the report is published, because those reports are also highlighting the gaps in knowledge and what is policy relevant. And so by looking at the report, you can find out what to research next. So that's also a very good way of being involved. And then I just want to finish on the fact that on the fact that there is currently the the, sug the review of the second order draft for the working group one, which is the science basis that is currently open and up to the uh, 5th of June. And if you want to register as an expert reviewer, then you could take part in the IPCC process and that would be great. Thank you all for your really insightful presentations. I'm sure everyone who's watching this on YouTube has a lot of questions. And actually, I also have my own. So before we finish up the presentation today, I'm going to ask each of you one to two questions um, that I, I have and they're, they're really burning. So hopefully people who are watching this have the same questions. If you are watching this and you have different questions, remember you can put them in the comment section below. Um, if you do this during the week of sharing geoscience online, we will respond to you. So my first question is to Solmaz. Um, Solmaz, you talked a little bit about the EGU's science policy pairing scheme. And firstly, I was wondering, what was your favorite thing about this pairing scheme? What was your favorite activity? And secondly, was there something that this science policy pairing scheme enabled you to do afterwards? Um, yeah, so to be honest with you, my very favorite activity was 
the fact that I was asked to provide scientific input on a topic that was outside my field of expertise. Um, when I was asked about this, uh, this is climate change and um, sea level rise and the impact of that on coastal communities in Baltic Sea, a region that I am not very familiar with. Um, and when I was asked to do that, I was actually really nervous and it wasn't really my favorite part of the ski. Uh, but in retrospect, I realized that really that was the best thing that could have happened because it really pushed my boundaries and put me a little bit outside of my comfort zone. And um, so that I had to really work hard and figure out really how I am able to provide some input that is going to be helpful uh, to the member of parliament. And um, this challenge was really by far, um, I would say the most interesting uh, thing about the pairing scheme that I experienced. In terms of what um, the pairing scheme enabled, to, um, enabled me to do afterwards, um, I became even more motivated to get involved with um, more hands-on um, activities related to the science policy, um, but a little bit more also in my own field. So as I mentioned uh, during my presentation, I'm a NASA hazard scientist and specifically uh, focusing on earthquakes and earthquake risk. Um, so I would say it was, um, yeah, two or three months after uh, I did the pairing scheme that I applied uh, for a school called Evidence for Policy School, and the topic was disaster risk management. And um, this school was organized by the European Commission's um, Joint Research Center, which I became aware of and actually got to meet some of its representatives when I was in Brussels as part of the pairing scheme. Um, so I applied for the school and, um, and I was able to actually get into the school and go to Florence in Italy um, in January earlier this year. And um, this was really helpful to me because there were a number of master courses that were being offered by both policymakers and scientists, as well as practitioners. And um, it really allowed me to understand how these three different groups can come together and be useful to one another. But uh, most importantly, what I got out of that experience was um, to get connected with people who are advocating for evidence-informed policymaking and uh, build my network a bit more. Great, great. Um, okay, next question is for Flo. So you did mention Brexit a little bit in your presentation, um, but I was wondering how Brexit has actually influenced your own activities and also science policy more generally in the UK. Yeah, thanks, Chloe. Um, the answer is a lot. Um, it had a major impact on science policy and also on the focus of many different organisations. So prior to the referendum, we were working pretty hard to input into EU policy making. Lots of organisations in the UK were engaging with Brussels and thinking about um, yeah, UK science policy in both the EU and a, and a UK context. And that has um, slipped away quite a lot in the intervening years because of new focuses. And the main areas that it's had an impact on are research funding and research projects and also immigration. So with research funding, um, we had to work quite hard to represent the views of our community in terms of access to Horizon 2020 and Horizon Europe. Um, going forward. So lots of people reported losses of access to some funding um, streams in Horizon 2020 and there's a lot of discussion in the science community about what might work best for the UK um, in terms of an association agreement. And then there's also been a lot of work on the immigration side. So the UK government has brought a new immigration bill that will come into place after Brexit is finished. Um, or at least in the first part finished uh, and there's been a lot of work to communicate to government the various skills gaps that we have in the UK which are quite substantial um, and that many of those skills gaps were you know in geoscience as well were previously filled by a more fluid immigration system so there's been a lot of learning a lot of communication and yes um, definitely a refocus away from some of the stuff we were doing before. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> um, yeah, a bit of a curveball, I guess. Um, but good to hear that you're sort of managing with it, even if your activities have changed somewhat. Yeah, it's been really interesting. But yeah, it's, it was quite a, it's quite a sudden shift in focus. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, final question is for Sophie. And Sophie, this is a bit more of a personal one, but I was actually wondering as a science officer within the IPC Working Group 1, what does your, what do your activities look like? Like, what do you work on on a daily basis? Well, it's a little bit hard to say that there is one typical day because it really depends on at which stage of the process we are, but we are there to make sure that uh, we offer support to the authors and we're also there to uh, to try to to get a report that is as good as possible. And so, for instance, one of the tasks I'm doing at the moment is that uh, we've got thousands and thousands of comments from the first round of preview. And I have to go to find a way to go through all those comments and make sure that, first of all, there is an, a reply to every comment. And second, that those reply are not just, we will do that later or just uh, <laughs> nothing or is that it's, uh, that, it's, that it's the right reply. But we also have some work that we were doing a lot of uh, putting a lot of effort into trying to coordinate between chapters because the problem is that I, as I said, one report is like thousands of pages and they are organized by chapters. So even within a chapter, it's hard to get a, a good overview on what's happening within the chapter, but it's even harder to uh, to get a good overview of what's, what's happening in another chapter. So we're doing a lot of work to try to make people talk to each other, giving the authors deadlines and trying to to get a forum where we make sure that they are actually talking about the same thing in similar ways and also sometimes if they are doing their own assessments that they are not com coming to completely different conclusions. So those are a few examples of what I'm doing. Right, so um, we're going to finish on that note, but again, if anyone watching this has any questions, please put them in the comment section below and thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>